welcome to Note Doctors. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In this podcast, we will be talking about all things theory with some of the best music theory teachers in the country. If you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. Hello and welcome back to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. Well, we've made it. We made it to the end of the semester. It's recording at the end of May. Actually, May 31st, I think, is today. And so we have both, or we have all finished up. We have graded our last sightseeing exam, our last paper, our last test, our last composition project. We've been decompressing for the past two weeks and are just now able to talk about what in the world just happened over the past (laughs) four months or so of our lives and so we're going to kind of just do a little recap on what how our semesters went the exciting things that happened in our lives um, why we've been so kind of hit or miss with our episodes getting out on time <laughs> and um, and then answer uh, some of your uh can we call it can we call it fan mail i don't yeah, i don't sure is, is it fan mail i don't, I don't even know it's <laughs> friend it's mail friend people, mail or um people uh, contacting note doctors mail <laughs> yes yes Yes, I think that's that's a good one. Uh, so yeah, so how did uh, your semesters go, Jen and Ben? Ben, do you want to start? Sure, I'll start. I can talk about a few things. Um, one of my goals this semester was to do more assessment with composition projects, more creative and artistic-based assessments that are project-based um, versus just coming in and memorizing, you know, what a passing tone is, A, B, C, D, multiple choice question or something like that. You know, not that I've done a ton of those in the past, but I was trying to really get the students to write a period or write a sentence. Um, and part of the challenge of that is that the prompt itself is hard to write. And it's hard to really grade something and say, well, your composition was a D minus. You know, you don't want to, you know, (laughs) say that to someone, um, but you do want to help them be able to be artistic and expand their creativity and really, Mm -hmm. you know, facilitate that. And and that's a challenge. So I, for theory two, I did two different prompts for compositions. One of them was a character theme. So they picked a character from a TV show, film, book, um, whatever it was that they had been watching. As long as it was school appropriate, I said fine. And then they wrote based on the, they listed the features of that particular character, and then we went down different aspects of the music. What timbre do you think would best fit this particular character? What meter? What types of rhythmic patterns and why? And they had to answer why they were making these decisions, making these creative decisions. Uh, That was number one. The second one, was based on an um, art piece, the visual art piece. So they had to choose some sort of visual art piece prompt. Um, You know, it could have been the Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali, or some of them picked Picasso uh, things. Um, But it didn't necessarily have to be a painting. You know, it could have been anything, really. Uh, One of my students wanted to do something about Saturn eats the child or something like this that was kind of disturbing, but Hmm. it created a very interesting (laughs) musical piece. (laughs) So that was cool. Um, But yeah, and then uh, they did that for the second one, and that was kind of interesting too, uh, with the same types of questions. You know, what timbres do you think of when you think of uh, Picasso's whatever piece, you know? uh, Guernica and all these uh, things. So we, we had a good time with both of those, and I did give them some class time to work on it, and I thought that was fun um, because at the end of the semester, everyone is burned out like crazy. I don't know if you all felt it as much as as I did this semester, mm-hmm. and maybe our For listeners sure. can chime in with more emails on this one, but the burnout this term I felt like was higher than, than past years. I don't know if it was Agreed. just a return to in-person yeah. or yeah. what, but... 
we were all feeling the burnout. So to give them the class time and to be able to sit down and look at their project and say, you know what, I love the choice for the French horn ensemble for Hercules, you know, or whatever it is, and to go through it and say, you know what, your French horn actually has to be a perfect fifth off, you know, and to make those corrections <laughs> in class, especially when they're writing for timbres that they're not familiar with. I think I talked about it one time before, but I'll go ahead and say it again. I think that's really important for all of them to be writing for things that they're not as familiar with, and that really expands their palette um, for sure. what they can do. So that was one thing, one thing that I did this term it was slightly different. Nice. Were you able to have them? any of them performed? Yeah, quite a few. Well, one of them was 29 parts, I think. You know, <laughs> my student David, he does a good job with all this uh, really dense composition. And I think probably eight or nine of those lines were different percussion parts. So it was very dense. Um, but then you have people who just wrote a simple vocal melody. Um, and wrote chord changes underneath. So that was, you know, some of the more basic version. But that was really cool to talk about. I mean, for me, voice is not my area. So I always learn a lot working with vocalists and saying, well, I want to put it in this exact part of the voice for such and such reason. And I wanted this mm -hmm. lyric to occur here for such and such reason with this kind of support or in this rhythmic pattern. Um, that's kind of a challenge for me always. I always learn a lot talking to the vocalists about their mm -hmm. compositions if they're uh, putting lyrics in there, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so that mm -hmm. was fun. Yeah, a lot of them were performed. It was great. It was, it was fantastic. That's awesome. I also did a lot more composition. This was in my Theory 3 class, which was a small group. I think I only had like 11 in there. They're all singers, and they're uh, kind of the off-track Mm -hmm. section so mm -hmm. they had fundamentals and so they had fundamentals in theory one all online which wasn't the the best time to learn mm -hmm. theory i think we right. all yeah. kind of right. realized like wow <laughs> they, they, did, they didn't quite know all the things that i thought they were going to know after a year of online fundamentals but um they they did well they learned a lot and so uh, since they were all singers i had um there's we do a unit on art songs and um kind of popular popular song and art songs arias things like that in the clandani marvin there's a kind of two chapters mm -hmm. on that so we did that in theory three and so they all had to write and perform their own basically song you know they had to pick like a quaternary form or that they, they write their own lyrics they had to or or come up with lyrics or find them um, and then they had to, to sing and, and play them um Though they didn't have, to, if they couldn't play and sing, we could find someone else to play. But a lot of them would sing and play, so that was that was really cool um, and, and neat for them to do. Um, uh, kind of, and they it was just all lead sheet. You mentioned just kind of the the notation. It was lead sheet and chords, and I had never done that. I, with all my composition projects, they'd always been like write everything out. And this was like I'm gonna like we're just gonna do lead sheets, and which. For some of those melodies that they were trying to write, that was really hard because, you know, these melodies that they'd come up with, I mean, the rhythms would be you know, dotted and triplets and all these things. And they're like trying mm -hmm. to like they're doing melodic dictation um, mm -hmm. of their own melodies. And so mm -hmm. that was that was that was challenging. And then I kind of had two other projects. The first one was just a rounded binary form. And I actually gave them two possible four measure um, themes. Because these students are not the most confident students. And I was like, I'm not going to just throw them out, figure out a theme. So I gave yeah. them two, you know, piano, uh, you know, uh, two, two themes that were just piano, four measures. And then they had to write, you know, uh, a parallel or a contrasting phrase and then a B section and then a return back to A. And then at the end of the semester, we did, they had to write a sonatina. And uh, that, but I had them use the same theme that they had originally written in the first one because some of them did well, some of them not so much. And it was kind of good for them to revisit that. Yeah. And I, I think the, the coolest thing with that was that these students did not have a lot of theory confidence before, mm. before the class. And you know, at the end of the semester, like we 
they wrote son- sonatinas, you know, with the development, with the recapitulation. And hey, heck, the recapitulation was exactly like the exposition, just as long as they remembered to modulate. Right, right. right. <laughs> you know? That's what Beethoven and Mozart did. Right, so. I know. And they're like, oh it's good gosh, enough for them. I can't believe I wrote something that's 47 measures long. <laughs> and um, But that was probably the, the neatest thing was just seeing their confidence level mm. raise. Yeah. Like, wow, we actually made this. And can you imagine starting out you could actually ever write something that actually sounded like good, you know, because if you follow kind of the uh, kind of basic processes, it works out most of the time. I mean, there are some things that were a little outside of maybe uh, 19th century convention, but um, it, for the most part, it was it was good. But I, yeah, I, I had those three composition exams or three compositions and just two kind of just normal exams. Um, and so I think maybe students did better it is, I agree, been kind of harder to grade um, those composition projects and uh, maybe a little bit more lenient on things. I don't know if yeah. you found that or like you were kind yeah. of like, like the, the kind of the average is a little bit higher on those composition projects than maybe a test would be. Right. But maybe that's OK. I don't mm-hmm. know. I think they get more yeah. out of it. And you find out things about your own teaching. I found out a lot mm-hmm. about my teaching of cadences that I never realized mm how much I had neglected meter and meter placement Mm. when talking about cadences because I had a lot of students that came to the end of the first four measures and on the fourth beat of the fourth bar they would put a five chord and then they'd say that's my half cadence but then I listened I wasn't actually looking at their score I'd say play a bit or play me the melody I said I didn't hear your half cadence because obviously the first three beats of the bar were like a one chord and a one six or something and then they just got to this fleeting five on the fourth beat and I was thinking that really isn't a half cadence you know I'm like yeah. they know uh, clearly I taught them that a half cadence is a phrase that ends on five but then like there is something more mm. to really writing a half cadence where you emphasize mm-hmm. five based on the metric placement like most half cadences the five is on beat one right because the goal of that phrase is to get to the dominant so you can put it on beat one But fundamentally, I clearly had not articulated that well in my teaching, and I took that for granted. I mean, you see them try to write that first phrase that ends on five, and they just plopped it in on the fourth beat. You know, you think, Mm -hmm. well, how does that sound? What does this sound like the goal of the phrase is? Because you've got this making sound like one is actually the goal in the fourth measure instead of five, because it's on that weakest part of the bar. So yeah, just stuff Mm -hmm. like that, and you think, wow, next time I teach this, I need to really focus on, like, how this is occurring within the meter in addition to the fact that it's just a phrase that ends on five you know it's so true and it points out that kind of disconnect that sometimes happens too where they're they're not really listening to what they wrote with a critical ear right. enough to say i don't know that that sounds like a half cadence why doesn't it sound like a half cadence? Right. you know mm-hmm. i did um the so after the first time ever in my life that I did composition projects, which was many, many years ago, the second time I did them, I actually made the students identify their own composition. I would play their melody at the piano and I would make them identify it. Um, and that was part of their grade to be able to identify their own composition. And you would be shocked how many of them get it wrong. They don't know what they wrote. Um because I was like, you have to have played it or sung it. It has to, you know, you have to recognize it as something you uniquely did. So, yeah, it's an interesting element where I don't know if they get really disconnected from the sound of it by just looking at the page. Or I don't know if maybe they are engaged in the sound of it, but they're not really thinking about, like, what does a half cadence sound like? I don't know where that disconnect mm-hmm. is. Yeah. But, yeah, a, yeah, metric a placement is a big thing. There's a yeah. problem solving component because they yes. they can probably know they know it doesn't sound quite right, but they don't know how to solve the yes. problem. Like I have a similar thing. I'll have students with like cadence. You know, it'll be an introduction, and they'll do like a five on that measure, the fourth measure, and then they'll end on a one on beat four, and then start the next phrase on beat one. <laughs> so you get five one one, and I'm like, why does it sound like they're like it just doesn't have a, like it sounds you know stuck or it doesn't go anywhere well because you're you're have that one chord 
and they're like, well, I got it. It's an authentic cadence at the end of that first phrase, but like it stops it short. Like you're you're giving right. away the punchline before, and so like you take that one chord out and then just hold the five, and they're like, wow, that sounds so good. Now <laughs> when the downbeat on measure five, it goes to one. But yeah. like that is that problem solving. Like why does it? not sound the way I, I want it to you know and it's it's the same thing with like notation like they mm -hmm. they know what they want to sound like but can they figure out how to show that mm -hmm. so it's yeah challenging. I am um, I allowed actually because of this podcast uh, and Blaze Ferrandino who said that not all students want to do composition projects and maybe that's not a way that all students learn about things. I think yep. I love that it sounds like you did like smaller projects that were kind of baked in throughout the semester and not some huge, like big final mm -hmm. thing yeah. that they had to turn in. Um, but so I have changed my upper level kind of final projects to where the students have a choice between um, I've tweaked it across the years, but they can write an analysis paper, they can write a composition, or now I've included they can do a complete trans, um, transcription of something, hmm. which means like they can't just turn in a lead sheet. They have to turn in like what the drums did, what the bass guitar did. It has to all be completely written out. And uh, one of the students, I made the transcription students write a reflection, like just a one paragraph reflection on how it went. And one of the students said, I had no idea how bad at this I was <laughs> until I tried to do it. And, you know, it made me realize, like, we probably need to be doing scaffolding of that kind of thing in lower levels as well, like either in theory or oral skills where they have, even if it's short, two, three measures, four measures, where they have to find, like, isolate all those different voices and figure out what each of those voices is doing and things like that. Um, like, for example, one of the students, it was a song that had a pickup, and the student was starting it on beat one. And mm -hmm. <laughs> said, mm -hmm. like, the first time that we looked at it together, I spotted it right away. And I said, well, what do you think about the rhythm? And she said, it's so weird. It doesn't sound at all like the recording, but I can't figure out what's wrong with it because all the values are right. And I was like, <laughs> let's investigate. <laughs> like, I could see right away, like, measure one. And I didn't even know the song. I just saw measure one, and I was like, that's supposed to be a pickup. I can wow. just tell. You know, so right. I think sometimes those kinds of, even if they require you to help them solve the problem, yeah. those are really advantageous mm -hmm. learning opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah, they're really it's good like, conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, with, with, they put in a Muse score, and it sounds yeah. right. But it doesn't look right. They're like, I'm getting all these ties, you know. And then you look at it, and like, <laughs> then you haven't listened to it, and like, you know, conduct, and it ends up like the downbeat is on beat two of every measure, right? Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. yep, that's that's your problem. Yep. And just knowing it starts on a pickup and getting them to feel that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mentioned kind of this stratification. I'm picking out these lines, and uh, my TA Dorian asked them, "What do you think you want to teach?" You know, in your teaching segment. And that was the topic um, that they chose. And mm. it was really interesting how they put together a really nice lesson for my theory, too, about what's going on in different layers of different popular... It was all popular music. Uh, and then the class responding to that. Some people in the class were getting every single question, and other people were completely clueless, clueless because they'd never thought about, you know... Is it a drum machine or is it a drum kit or you know mm -hmm. what is it exactly, mm -hmm. um, and how does that factor into these layerings that are going on? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I thought that was a really really nice lesson that I certainly, you know, would not be prepared to teach tomorrow. I would have to read up right. a couple of days on that before I walked mm -hmm. in and taught that. But but my TA is a pop music scholar, so I got lucky. Well, it was part of the class, <laughs> but I didn't do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that that type of listening is also really good for when you get to third, uh, uh, 20th century music because there's all mm -hmm. that stratification going on the different layers mm -hmm. um, and you can make a connection to, to seeing how those tracks are kind of layered with kind of the way that Bartok uses different you know, you know, different sets of octonic scale or something like that these different layers and so that's cool yeah it was fun absolutely absolutely I don't know about, well, so I taught pedagogy for the first time this semester, and it was so much fun. Um, I loved it. 
And I loved the group of students that was in that class, and they were so engaged. It was a really super small class. There were three of them and me. And um, so that means we did a lot of really good discussion. And uh, they're all three theory majors, so they have, like, all their classes together. They already know each other really well. But so we had a really, we had a really good semester. But nothing will make you think about everything you do in the classroom more than teaching pedagogy of theory. Like, I don't, mm-hmm. having, you know, having done it for the, just this first time, I would show up to class and then be like, well, tomorrow I need to do everything better. Like, <laughs> nothing I'm doing is enough. <laughs> like, I'm telling them to do all these things, but I need to now do this and this and this and this. Yeah. Um, I think that was kind of the biggest ongoing thread of the semester. And even... We did. A, we had a lot of discussions about um, diversifying the repertoire, and I was really pleased that one of the students in their final reflection for the semester said that was the biggest thing that they had never thought about before that now is, like, central to how they think about how they will teach music theory in the future. That's great. I was really pleased to hear that. Um, but it, it also made me do more of that in my own teaching because I'd be if I went to hunt for yet another you know piano Beethoven example of something I'd be like I can do better I can do better Mm -hmm. you know so I did a lot more transcribing myself um, this semester just because a lot of the music that I would want to use is not written out and the fastest and easiest way to do that was to just sit there and write it out myself Um, and it's interesting I, I think that that's helpful even for us to keep that skill going. I mean, obviously we started dictation years and years and years ago, and I don't necessarily do melodic dictation every day. Um, But it is interesting how it's like riding a bike. Like that first time you get back on it, you're like, wait a minute, how does all of this work? (laughs) And then after like a couple pedals. along with the chain. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like after a couple pedals, you're like, oh, okay, yep, it's all in there. I've got it all. It's all good. Um, But I found it really, really helpful and really beneficial to do all that transcription this semester myself. Um, And it's something I set kind of a couple projects for the summer, like, you know, do these couple songs and, you know, just to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Well, Jen, you you know, we do have the internet that has like every chord change (laughs) of every song. You can just Google it. Well, sometimes you can't or sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes they're wrong. That's right. So um, even when... Even when I was able to find it, and I don't always want to pay for them either, so sometimes, you know, you can't find a lead sheet or something Mm -hmm. that isn't behind a paywall. And so, but even when you can, a lot of times, I would still have to look at it because I would find stuff that was wrong. And inevitably, if I didn't look at it closely enough, the students would find stuff that was wrong. That happened a couple times where I was like, oh, it's fine. This is right. This is close (laughs) enough. And then one of the students would be like, in measure two, that rhythm is totally wrong. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, you're right. It is completely wrong. Um, (laughs) So, and then I, you know, make sure I go back and fix it before um, I use it again next year or whatever. But yeah. That that brings up uh, another thing with, is that song originally um, just sung. It's not notated. And so the notation comes after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. So that's... That's another kind of interesting to think about is that in these pop songs, someone's not notating those melodies. Like no. it's they're they're playing through this loop and the singer is improvising basically and they kind of put it put it together and then they record it, right? And so mm-hmm. the notation of it comes afterwards. So depending on who's transcribing that or how how tricky is that melody, it's gonna mm-hmm. there's gonna be some issues with that, right? Totally. Yeah. You can usually understand what happened that made it wrong you know mm-hmm. <laughs> like you can uh, yeah i see why you would write that rhythm that way or why right. you thought that was the the right the right way to do that but mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's also been a crazy year like you mentioned we're gonna talk about kind of why we've done fewer episodes especially this spring and i know for me Uh, This year has been insane. So I went up for full professor in the fall and got that. My dad passed away this fall. I got engaged this spring. Um, I had the return to, like, live performances with the symphony uh, this year. But especially this spring, we did Eugene Onegin, uh, the opera, and then Beethoven 9. So that's been very busy. And then on top of that, I was elected president of the symphony chorus. So that's also amping up the busyness level a little bit. 
Um, but yeah, between planning a wedding and teaching new classes like Pet of Theory and oh, we also did conferences. So I had a Texas Music Educators Conference. I was there with our students and then recruiting at some of the events there. And we did the Texas Society for Music Theory together. So, you know, long story short, it's been a busy and very change filled year, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, <laughs> it has, it's a lot it of has been, yeah, oh my gosh, when you kind of list it like that, Jen, right? it's like, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, and of course, um, you know, your your regular teaching workload and all that stuff like that. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually just got tenure officially this i think last week i don't know Ooh, so i'm technically associate yay. right now um and because it's a state school it takes forever so yeah we started at the same time but i was done in like december yeah you're you're done in december and i wasn't done till middle of may with all of the yeah. flaming hoops that it had to go through and so it's crazy but yeah um yeah it's a you lot you made it wow <laughs> you made it feel? to what I don't know. <laughs> made it to what? I mean, that's the, I don't know, that's the thing that I think about is, like, you know, these, like, as a, as an academic, you know, someone who's, like, we've all spent, you know, most of our life in school, um, and why do we do that? Because we like school, we're high achieving, we like we, and we like to be told that we're doing a good job and we you know it's like this it, it breathes a certain type of student right and a certain mm-hmm. type of individual and yeah, and at a certain point you're like why are we doing all of this <laughs> right, it turns out like once you get once you get to a certain point in academia they stop telling you how great you are all the time <laughs> right or how yeah, they... smart you are or how yeah mm-hmm. that that is true for sure yeah and I don't know. And it's and it, the thing is, like, to get to a place where you can be, I don't know, happy with your job or, mm-hmm. or, or, or content with where you're at, one is kind of like, there's one piece where it's like, one that you should never, like, you, know, you should be looking for the next big thing, you know, right. where, where do you go? Um, but also there's the fact that so many don't ever get to that place, you know? Yeah to to have any type of security um in in your profession you know is a huge is a huge blessing i I saw some Mm -hmm. meme it was like academia is the only one only kind of career that requires you to be basically um homeless or like not have a like a home base for you know years and years and years until finally you move to a town that you're going to die in um (laughs) it's But like this, and it's like dark, but true, yeah, right. Like there's this like contingent life that we agree to, right? right. With graduate school, with you know, where are you going to go to get your, you know, where are you going to go after you get your degree? Well, wherever that will, you know, wherever it will hire me, right? And whether that's visiting, whether that's a, a lecturer, whether that's just adjunct, whatever, um, and uh, just waiting until you get to that, you know, that secure job where you're you're there and you're planted there and i don't know it's it's i don't know if i i feel guilty a little bit for Mm -hmm. survivor's guilt (laughs) yeah yeah, survivor's guilt you know um because it it's it's really crappy for a lot of people and um and i there's not really a way that I, i can see of it getting better i don't know i know if you're out there and it's bad like we're sorry and sometimes the crazy things do happen like i had an adjunct position that turned into a full-time position so did paul um so something that they say is never gonna happen sometimes those things do happen um and i have friends who are on the market for a long time and then eventually did land a job and you know a full-time great position so it does it does happen but yeah the slog is hard and then the kind of irony is that once you get there then you're like wait a minute I have a life (laughs) I have like a whole other life it's not just teaching music theory which is pretty great but uh you know and you guys I mean you guys both have kids you have 
you know, spouses, I'm, I have a soon to be spouse, but you have, you know, people living with you in your house who you are responsible to that have nothing to do with teaching music theory. And, uh, you've had busy years that way too. So, oh yeah. Yeah. All of those things make an impact. Yeah. My kids are two and five right now, which makes mm-hmm. me kind of happy that I'm not on the tenure track some days because <laughs> right? I think they're so needy. Elise, right. you know, she had two accidents during the last episode, just to be honest with the listeners. <laughs> so I had There's a lot a of work to do. There's a reason why we don't release the Zoom. Exactly. Right. As soon as we stopped recording, I had a lot of work to do around the house, <laughs> let's put it that way. So I'm kind of glad. You know, I am up for promotion. My my lecture position does have does have promotional levels to it, which is very nice. But I'm kind of glad that I don't have a position that's tied to a heavy research component even though i do work at an r1 school mm-hmm. it's kind of yeah. nice um so yeah i don't either and that's partially why my tenure system or my tenure process moved so much faster my promotion process yep. moved so much faster is because they just had to observe me teaching and that was the biggest part mm-hmm. so yeah yeah i think it's it's finding those margins and like eventually you come to the point where you know, your work is not the most important thing in your life. And I mean, that sounds obvious. Like we'd all like right. assent to that. Work is not the most important thing in your life, but when you're a grad student, it very much is the most important thing yes. in your life. And then when you get that job, you know, you want to keep that job. So yes. it becomes the most important thing in your life. And the thing is, your you place your work is never going to love you back. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. I mean, I I love TW. I love where I work, but at the same time, it's 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 a job, and and, and uh, right. you know, you, you, we have families, and you you we have hobbies, and we have other things that are meaningful in our life, and um, and I think that maybe helps to to diminish the the, the amount of burnout is when you can actually like mm-hmm. put that put that work aside for a while, and yes. Uh, enjoy your your life exactly exactly definitely definitely yeah we've had a lot of burnout throughout undergraduates also graduates i think especially graduate students felt the burnout this spring you know and how do you fight that i mean you try to achieve some sort of balance in your life i guess you know yeah yes that's true but also so there's a there's a book called burnout um if you didn't know this, you should. Everyone should read it. Everyone should go read it immediately. It's excellent. Emily I'm Nagoski. Out from reading books. <laughs> <What if> I- <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> but it's very readable. Um, Emily Nagoski is the author, and her sister as well, whose name I don't remember. Sorry to said sister, but Emily Nagoski. Uh, the book is Burnout, and it's really good. And one of the things that the book points out is that. The, this idea that we can just like set better boundaries and take better care of ourselves, and that's going to be enough to overcome burnout is false because it, it doesn't those things like don't last long term in the sense that what you have to do is practice actual real self-care and um, which is not bubble baths and pedicures or whatever guys do that is considered self-care but is in fact things like getting enough sleep like setting a boundary around things like sleep and getting consistent um, exercise. She talks about how our modern stress responses are kind of out of whack because our stress responses are part of us because they were there to help protect us from things like, you know, a lion that would chase us in the forest. (laughs) Okay. So we're not being chased by lions, but it can feel like we are still. And you have to, there's a whole cycle that your body goes through when you are in like actual physical danger, that when the danger is not that way, you still have to complete that cycle or that stress just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds over time. So anyway, it's a great book and it's made a big difference for me. So burnout, Emily Nagoski. No doctor's book club, number one. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) That's a good idea. Uh, That that reminds me of... um, what a, a thesis i was on a committee this spring for a, a music therapy student and it was on 
self-care and she was doing her internship so if music therapist therapy students had to do a six month internship usually not paid and um, in anywhere part of the country yeah so she was in north carolina doing her six month internship also had to have like a part-time job um but during her her internship she basically also did her kind of um kind of thesis which was on her own practice of self-care which was basically playing music with her guitar like she and she journaled Mm. every she every time she played she journaled she recorded herself it's like this huge just kind of recording of her own experiences and um, it was pretty powerful like how how that how that practice because it was a practice for her of Mm -hmm. uh, of using music and in fact she got a different guitar so she didn't use the guitar that she used in her music therapy internship she had a she got a different guitar that was just like Part of it was because she had to like disinfect the guitar that she was using in the clinic and things like that because of COVID. Mm. Uh, but like even having a separate guitar that she could play on that was different than kind of her work guitar. Mm. Um, but it was really profound and how how that really helped her. And so like um, afterwards, one of the other committee members, she's music therapy faculty, were like, we need to have like like a self care like piano, uh, like an ensemble like where we just. <laughs> Like get together, faculty, students, whoever, and we're just gonna play some music. We're just gonna like every week, and um, because I think that's something that the students crave is still keeping that 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 musical love. It, because mm-hmm. unfortunately, the music that they're studying, and we we've all been there, is not what they love, and um, and they lose touch of that. Like everything that they're doing is music related, but it's actually not music that's really fulfilling them. And mm. how could we kind of prov- provide a space where we can, you know, give them some outlet for kind of these fulfilling musical experiences, um, whether that's listening, whether that's just playing, no pressure, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, it's something that we, we've, I was like kicking around, maybe we might do that next, next year. We'll see. Yeah. That's cool. I like that's that. Very cool. I love it. But yeah. So... Yeah, we made it. That's that we made good. it. We made it. <laughs> so if you've been wondering where all the episodes have been, uh, all of been, our fans. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All, all the fans. All and speaking the fans. of all the fans, that's a good segue. Oh, it is. Um, we have some mail. We got some mail. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's. All right, I'm going to read this email. This is from. This is not music theory related at all. But this is uh, from. My friend Jen Jennifer Sanborn Miller. I actually grew up with her. We grew up like in the same, not the same town, but basically the same town. And um, she wrote us, and um, she. I'll just read it. Uh, Hello, Paul, Jen, and Ben. I understand about 0.5 percent of what you discuss musically, <laughs> but I but I tune in for the first five minutes to hear about the career journey of your guests. I am a friend of Paul's and appreciate the production quality and content that you live, deliver. Your podcast is a nice distraction for me from my real life as a school counselor for fourth through sixth grade students. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> yeah. As your success <laughs> continues and your fame grows, uh, uh, please oh keep that question as your introduction. I think it's important for students to j- hear that journey is often a long mm. and winding road. I really just wrote this so I can get a shout out on the podcast, but I also <laughs> mean every word. Great work, Jen Sanborn Miller. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, That's your shout thank out. you, Jen. <laughs> yeah, so she is a she is a, a, a school counselor, uh, though her husband is a music therapist, and we talk about music all the time. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was a really nice nice uh, email. And uh, it is, and it's true yeah. that there are lots of similarities. Like themes that come up and how people end up where they end up. Um, yeah. Music education is a common path for people. We've noted that one. Um, but also, everyone has these really unique ways that they got to where they are now, including us. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that is, I don't think we'll ever ditch that question. I like it. I think it's good. Yeah. And yeah, we'll keep it. We'll keep it for sure. All right, here's another one. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is from. Tim Wilson. Hey guys, hope you're well. I'm a jazz commercial saxophonist, educator, and content slash curriculum creator with Aurelia and musician Arles Theory programs. I've been really loving the podcast and the conversations that it generates. You've accompanied me on many nighttime COVID lockdown walks. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's possible. Uh, it's possible already on your list for the current series, but I was wondering if you're going to be discussing theory slash aural for music production slash commercial music students. Thanks. Yeah, I think we we actually mm-hmm. were talking a little bit about that before uh, we we started recording, and uh, we have a couple ideas because uh, that's an, another really kind of interesting career um, that yeah. needs theory, that needs especially aural skills. You know, someone who's oh, yeah. working in a studio who's mixing, who's doing uh, production, like, I mean, you've, everything is ears, everything, it's all about what you can hear. And it'd be interesting to talk to someone uh, a, who has experience in that domain, kind of what, what they what they took away, you know, from, from mm-hmm. oral skills and what they took away from theory, you know. Absolutely. Hope you're doing we just well, have to... thanks for writing. Yes, for sure. All right. And, and, and then our uh, our last our last email, and again these were sent to note doctors podcast at gmail dot com. That's note doctors podcast at gmail dot com. <laughs> if you want to write us, um, and then this is from all right, uh, David. I'm going to probably butcher your last name, um, but so I will not read it. But it's from David. Um, and uh, it says, let's see, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for all the value that you are providing through your work. I'm a musicology PhD student at Sorbonne University in France, and I enjoyed listening to your interviews. Uh, my research focuses on enhancing oral skills learning through digital tools. I'm aware of the work of Gary Karpinski, and I know he and many other people have expressed concerns about focusing on atomistic drill exercises. However, I struggle to find academic literature supporting it. Could you please help me identifying the main sources? I appreciate you. really appreciate your help. Thank you in advance. And sorry, David, this, you wrote this in February, and we're just now getting around to it, so hopefully this is not ruining your whole research project waiting for us to respond, but I'm sure <laughs> hopefully you're not. doing great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we did actually find a couple of things. Jen, you want to pull up what you found, and I'll, I'll maybe bring up what I have to. Yeah, I found some sources actually of Gary's, um, Gary Karpinski's that he cites, and one of them is Merton Shatskin. Uh, who wrote the article Interval and Pitch Recognition in and Out of Immediate Context, and that's from the Journal of Research in Music Education. And then the other is Joel Wapnick and Gary Barasa and Joanne Sampson, and they wrote the article The Perception of Tonal Intervals in Isolation and in Melodic Context, and that was in Psychomusicology 2. Those articles are both from the early 80s. I'm sure there's been some research done since then, but those are at least a place to start. Yeah, and uh, another place to look is an article that William E. Lake wrote. This is from the Journal of Music Theory Pedagogy. It's called Interval and Scale Degree Strategies in Melodic Perception. Um, And it's kind of just interesting in talking about how different students listen to things depending on if they hear things scale-related or interval-related. So Mm -hmm. scale-related being built off of like you know solfege or where it is in the scale versus um intervals um and that made me that question made me think about the michael rogers music theory text uh, pedagogy book because i just love mm-hmm. it jen did you use some of that for you i did for your... yeah they read the whole book they... i love that book <laughs> yeah, so much so good. i like get inspired every time i read through it um and i just wanted to read this one thing because i'm curious what you guys think and i just think it's like so good if i can find it let's see ah here we go all right this is kind of long so i'll try to use my energetic voice but it's just you can't stop he just he just he he, he, the flow of his writing is unstoppable Uh, um so let's see uh this is talking about ear training it is easy for teaching materials a single course or an entire ear training program to become mired in the purely perceptual level of hearing. Because of the human need for security, we are always attracted to teaching situations in both ear training and analysis that favor absolute right or wrong answers, since identification, recognition drills, and short isolated examples most satisfyingly fulfill these needs, more interpretive hearing situations tend to be ignored. Accuracy, figured always in terms of a percentage of correct responses, becomes too easily the measure of success in the program. And since percentages are so tangible, and for almost everybody can be raised, 
The goal of perfect scores becomes the tail that wags the dog. Longer or more cumbersome musical examples sometimes are eliminated from ear training programs since they don't fit the pre-selected category of problem with neat solution. Often, that's in quotes, Often, the best ear training questions, again, like analysis, are those that allow many right answers because legitimate differences in hearing are possible. Some listening situations have no answers at all since their goal is to steer the listener's attention towards features, connections, etc. that might otherwise have passed unnoticed. These types of questions stress the mental and musical processes involved in arriving at permissible answers rather than the answers themselves. Instead of responding passively to small doses of external stimuli, analytical listening binds individual surface traits together through short-term and long-term memory and aural imagery. Teaching ear training from this point of view requires some knowledge of how we make sense of music. Why do some combinations of sounds form music and others do not? It requires knowledge, in other words, of analysis. The knowledge is not just about how notes are put together on paper, but about how the brain groups, simplifies, stores, retrieves, manipulates, and constructs sensory input. Ear training programs ultimately show their worth and their ability to teach students how the listening process itself operates. More important even than getting the right note or answer is learning how to hear a sound in its contextual relationship and knowing its meaning. Right answers can even be irrelevant or injurious if proper listening habits are slighted. I am not encouraging a diminished regard for accuracy, but I am suggesting that too much emphasis on numerical measurement of results can work at cross purposes to the goals of how to listen. Boom, Mike Rogers yeah. dropping the bomb there. A it's literal true. mic drop from Mike. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Nice, nicely done, done. Nicely done. <laughs> I love it. I just think that's I great. It. I and I think it's so challenging. I mean, because yes. you know, it brings me back to just the beginning of your conversation. Where we were talking about when you're teaching music theory pedagogy. You know, you read that, and that in that class, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing that in my own teaching. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you then you start re, re, redoing everything because you're like, wow, I am just trying to find things that are easily gradable, or uh, uh, you can always they're right or wrong, and that's that's not that's not the point. And even that it can harm kind of the 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 listening habits that are truly important to be a successful musician. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. it's a really nice quote. I mean, I think that is the challenge of trying to get the most possible creative activities, the most possible depth to our teaching, but still making it where we can somehow give people a grade at the end of the course. I mean, we do have to do that. And that, yeah, like he says, you know, you don't want to have that be the point of departure for your teaching. You want to be the, the creative activity, the, the outcomes, like, you know, referring back to Blaze, mm-hmm. Blaze's episode again. Mm-hmm. You have to have that be the starting point. And then eventually, yes, you do have to put a grade down. But mm-hmm. it's so easy to fall into that trap. I've definitely done it. I've definitely done it. Oh, yeah. It. We've all done it. Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. For sure. No, no, doubt, no doubt about it. But, yeah. I mean, I think uh, from the sounds of it, with your, with your composition projects, too, and, like, I mean, I think the students have learned so much, like, mm-hmm. the actual doing of it. And it's yeah it's a little bit trickier and you have to set up these rubrics and sometimes right. sometimes it's kind of hard to be like is this really mm-hmm. you know i usually put some type of artistic merit um bucket <laughs> in my rubric <laughs> just to like just to kind of give you know it's, it might just be like five points or whatever you know just mm-hmm. to, to just to a- acknowledge like for one if it's just so straight up like in the box it still gets an A. It's still great, but you know, if they're doing something that's interesting or they're, they're showing some real creativity, you're mm-hmm. honoring that too. So I love that's that. possible. Because even then, so. they get buried in the rubric. Right. Did right. I? I mean, we had to design. Okay, so here's here's one thing that applies to this. We were doing oral skills too. I was meeting with my TFs. We were trying to do a sentence improvisation. The basic ideas, we had written a couple basic ideas, so they did not have to write their own basic ideas. What they did have to do is sing, improvise the second basic idea, and -hmm. also the continuation, and and ideally end on a cadence. And we were trying to develop a, a rubric for this, and we basically came to a list of items. 
that it was just a checking off. Did they actually, yep. did the second basic idea resemble the general contour and rhythmic pattern of the first? I think that was one mm -hmm. of our, mm -hmm. one of our checkpoints, you know, but you, you can kind of do these basic checkpoints, but it becomes really hard to say that the second basic idea of one person was a 92 and the second basic <laughs> idea of another person was an 86. Yes. I mean, you just can't, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you have to say, well, that's what they did. You know, mm -hmm. and then did you actually bring it to the cadence? It was the continuation the proper length, you know. It was the continuation like only one bar versus the second mm -hmm. basic idea, which was supposed to be two measures. Obviously, that's not really a continuation. Right. So mm -hmm. it was basically a list of things that we we gave them the list, obviously, before they... Before a they flat rubric, so to speak. Like, did you do it Yes. Or not? Did you do it mm -hmm. or not? And that was the best thing we could come up with. In, yeah. our, in our in our meeting mm -hmm. but you know if anyone has any ideas in that regard email us i'd love to talk mm -hmm. about that sometime it'd be a great topic how do you design a good rubric for improvisational assessment that's a great topic i, I think flat uh, rubrics are a really good way to go um the key with a flat rubric is that they have to have the opportunity to like improve upon it because it is so black and white like you yes. did it or you didn't do it mm -hmm. there's no yes. in between there's no you know well you sort of did it no you either did it all the way or you <laughs> didn't do it <laughs> so like the, it's a good way to go but especially if they have the opportunity to try again um so that you can see those outcomes actually get reached so to speak what were you gonna yeah. say paul well i think i think it's i think that's great because music is not gradable like no. Th that's at the core of, of what we do is music and music mm -hmm. is not something that is that gets a grade you know Mozart never got a grade well maybe even a mistake right but like you look at a piece of music and you're like well that that Brahms symphony is I would give it an 87 percent like <laughs> no that makes no sense right no. like you know or like oh that Schubert song eh, C plus right that it doesn't even make sense that's an A plus song by right, Schubert right. what does that even it's, mean right yeah, yeah. and so is it is it doing what it's supposed to be doing on on its own terms I guess right, right. Um, and at the end of the day it's it's does it move you does it give you a musical experience um, are you transformed by it are you a different person from beginning to the end um, all those things are, are not quantifiable and so yeah. I think it's I, I think it's okay to be kind of uh, have this kind of flat rubric like did you do it or did you not um, because of course that's that's where it starts you know people rarely play Mozart's first piano sonatas why because they're so basic right <laughs> you know a child's you know and they're gonna, we're gonna get right. hate mail from all the people that love Mozart because he's oh, a genius right but like <laughs> like his music was just was functioning in the way that he was taught and how music worked right yeah. It wasn't until later on in his life, or granted, he moved at an accelerated pace than you know most people that's ever that have ever lived, right? But still, like the ways that he, he was able to get um, to these moments of a great expression uh, and musical power through writing countless, countless pieces, you know. And we're talking to these students who they've never written a song or a piece of music in their life, or one mm -hmm. or two. And right. so to be like, well, you know, to have this kind of kind of rubric, or did you do it or did you not? I think is totally acceptable and and perfectly mm -hmm. appropriate for their development. To be like, yeah, you did it. You you made a parallel period and you cadenced in the right spot. And good job, hundred percent. Right. Why, why why do we feel bad about that? You know. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and I think a flat rubric captures too like. Um, that element of quality that we're looking for when we're trying to grade something like this, meaning like some students don't have to put in a lot of effort and they can do it well. And some students have to put in a ton of effort to do it well. And then there are the students who just don't try. And a flat rubric kind of gets those students who just didn't try and shows them like you didn't achieve this or this or this or this, you know? Right. So I, I do like that aspect of it because on the one hand, like, we're not, on projects like that, sometimes I feel like I'm grading them based on how hard they worked, and that's not the question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's not the question. Yeah. Right. Um, so if a student can give me something that's, you know, and you're right, Paul, maybe that student loves to compose, and they write a lot on their own, so it doesn't take them, you know, hours and hours to produce something that's interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because they've done it a lot more or maybe it just comes more naturally but 
you know, you don't want to, like, punish that. But at the same time, either you want there to be a reward in place for students who did really, really try hard. And a flat rubric often captures that well, because students who have tried hard usually will have met those metrics or gotten close. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And sometimes the, in regard to a composition project, the, the elements that are complex may be in different domains. For example, I required all of my theory fours to write in asymmetrical meters. Some of them used 12-tone rows. Some of them did not. So, like, there was different domains some where mm-hmm. the, the complexity was in a lot of different musical domains, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. like, the rhythmic pattern may be very simplistic. But, like, that person mm-hmm. actually used, you know, a 12-tone row and different row forms. So the pitch mm-hmm. complexity was there. But then, like, it was quarter notes in 5-4. Somebody else did, you know, 7-8, 5-8, 7-8, 5-8, alternating. Right. Alternating asymmetrical meter. <laughs> they didn't use a 12-tone row, but, like... The complexity was just in a different domain. So I've kind of gone to this, like, asking them to explain their, um, you know, choices, Mm -hmm. their compositional choices. Why did you do this 7, 8, and 5, 8 thing? Well, it's because the character from this book had this kind of frenetic uh, bipolar nature. And I wanted to capture that by switching the meter every measure, you know. Uh, it's like, oh, that's so cool. You know, I need to read this book mm-hmm. now. I need to find out who this person <laughs> is. You know, but then some, some of the questions are more open-ended. Like, I asked a question about how did you create closure? You know, if you used whatever collection. I said they also couldn't do it in a major or minor key. Um, so I said, how did you create closure since you did not have a major or minor key in your particular character theme? And then just let them talk about it. You know, some of them Mm. said, I kind of converged on a note. And that was kind of my central note. And then some of them said, you know, well, it was the end of the 12-tone row. Or some of it was based on duration. You know, like it was all short values. And then there was this longer duration. It's like, yeah, that creates an element of closure. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's just as valid of an answer as the person that's saying it was the end of the retrograde form. You know, that was the (laughs) second phrase. You know, that's just as valid of of an answer so I gave those both the same same score but it's it's interesting to see that play out you know the more yeah. open ended mm-hmm. you are it does create these difficulties in assessment it does and really putting a number on it it doesn't mean you have to be 0 or 100 but it does mean you have to like break down what is it exactly that you're looking for and really be up front with them and give it to them beforehand. So they yes, know yeah, they have to know. You know, time. give it to them yeah, beforehand. Yeah, mm-hmm. And then they do look right. at the rubric and say, okay, I have to have a half cadence. Put, put that five chord in there on the last, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. So you want, yeah it, it, that <laughs> does create, like, does the rubric generate the composition? You don't want that to happen either. Um, but I think it's good to give it, give it beforehand so they know what they're going for. Yeah, I, so in the pedagogy class, their big final project was an assessment project, and I gave them different ways to assess or grade different types of things. So melodic dictation, sight singing, harmonic dictation, um, I'm trying to think what else they did. Those might have been the big ones. Oh, no, analysis and part writing. And they, came, they had to come up with their own rubric for part writing. I'm actually going to steal one of my students' rubrics because it was so good. Like, she found a way to kind of um, separate out. She pointed out that the rubric that I set up for them, because I made them use, like, here's one that's often used. Each chord is worth this many points or that each error is worth this many points, right? And she was like, what I didn't like about that was that it didn't allow for, like, the the melody and the harmony to be kind of their own entities that could be done well separately. Okay. So, which I was like, that's a really good point that I haven't ever really thought of before. And so the rubric she designed was really thoughtful. But it did, I made them use the AP rubrics for mm-hmm. um, sight singing and dictation, which is a whole other way of looking at assessment because the goal of those assessment techniques is that every grader would get the same response right so if that's your goal that everyone in the room would come up with the same exact answer every time that creates a really different kind of rubric um but going back through all of those kind of grading systems even with analysis and it helped me think like how do i want to do this in the fall i don't have to grade the same way every time and I made them grade the analysis assignment just like everything is worth a point. 
And then I made them grade the analysis assignment where the new concept was the worth the ma majority of points. And the other things were worth some points, right? Yeah. And it was interesting because the scores didn't come out that differently, but it did give a lot more feedback to students on the things that were new rather than just, you know, you still don't ever write inversion numbers, you know, or whatever. <laughs> we're two semesters in and you can't remember that 6-5 is first inversion of a seventh grade or whatever, you know. So there's lots of ways to go about it, but assessment is hard. We should do an assessment series. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, on different, yeah, part writing assessment, dictation assessments. Yeah. Improv assessments. Sounds like a great yeah. idea. Maybe that, is that is that going to be a summer short or shorts or is that going to be maybe so in the fall? oh interesting oh. I might need more time than summer I know I know. <laughs> <laughs> like I got I'm teaching a class this summer I don't know if I have enough time to do, do research on that too but um, yeah that's a great idea well we've been chatting for almost an hour we um, have. and so we probably should probably should wrap it up find a yeah, probably out. yeah and so. We will be back uh, later this summer with some summer shorts, and we've got some things in the works, and I think we're going to have some fun with those little shorter episodes um, to get you through those hot summer <laughs> days. Um, just to give you enough of note doctors that keeps you, keep, or keeps us still somewhere in your brain so you don't forget about <laughs> us by the time we come back with season three <laughs> in the fall. And by the way... Uh, Speaking of listeners, shout out to whoever is in Brazil listening to these podcasts. Over yes. the past over the past month, we've had like 400 downloads in Brazil. So I don't know what's happened in Brazil, but thank you, whoever you are, who clearly can understand English. Uh, my wife's actually been listening or been watching to Love Is Blind, the Brazil version, oh. which is totally bizarre um, <laughs> because she listens. It's in, it's in Portuguese, but. She listens to the, um, the, the the English that's dubbed over it, and it's mm -hmm. just so funny because the English is not um, expressive at all. It's like, I really like you. You have changed my life. <laughs> and like they, so that's how they speak, and you can see them. The the folks on the the screen are excited. They're passionate, you know, about each other. And like, this has been the greatest day of my life. I agree. <laughs> it's like, what's happening? <laughs> Sorry. That is non sequitur there, but anyways, all you <laughs> listeners in Brazil, thank you so much. I don't know how you found us, um, but uh, write us we, and tell we us. know that you're there. Write us and tell us. Yeah. <laughs> no doctors podcast at gmail dot com. All right, and so any last any parting words, Ben or Jen? I don't think so. Happy rest and recuperation to everyone out there who just got done teaching. Yeah, go yes. complete the stress cycle. Yeah. Get better. Get better for fall. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. We will be back with more interviews with professors and teachers who will be dropping all sorts of theory knowledge for your education, edification, and enjoyment. So until then, bye-bye.